So I'll go ahead and get us officially started by saying good morning and happy Advent to everyone. My name is Erin Bishop. I work here at the university in the Office for Mission, and I'm also the director of the Center for Christian Spirituality. And I'm really delighted to um, welcome certainly the university community. We have faculty, staff, and students with us this morning. Um, as well as members of the general community, folks from all over San Diego and all over. Um, and a special welcome to our USD alumni community. Really um, excited to be able to welcome you to uh, come back to campus as it looks these days and being able to, to join us in this, um, this morning's retreat. Uh, now to our presenter. I am delighted this morning to be able to welcome Cameron Bellum. I, I first encountered Cameron because of her prayer for a pandemic, which was recited the beginning of a uh, beginning of the pandemic back in March when I um, had one of my first kind of big Zoom meetings and was trying to figure out how it all worked uh, of of mission officers at Catholic colleges and universities, and the person who offered the prayer uh, didn't cite or give credit to Cameron, but I remember furiously Googling phrases that I could recall from it, trying to figure out who, who is this person who had this ability to, to capture this moment, this difficult moment, and, and, and write so beautifully about our desires, our hopes, our prayers for what this time would be. So it, it turns out a few, other thousand, a few thousand other people had also been sharing this prayer. It was all over YouTube, and it has shown up again and again, um, at least in circles that, that I frequent. So I encourage you to, to find that and check it out. I um, eventually found Cameron's website, um, and I'll show you that there now, um, which I encourage you to, to visit. I, I found more beautifully written prayers, meditations, resources and, and a deep sense of consolation for me personally during this time. And most importantly, I found her story, which is that after completing her PhD in Russian literature, she traded the academic life for the contemplative life with her family in Seattle, where she combines her love of language with a deeply rooted spiritual spirituality to compose prayers, poems, essays and devotionals linking our modern lives with our ancient faith. She's the author of A Consoling Embrace, Prayers for a Time of Pandemic from 23rd Publications and Advent with St. Oscar Romero, which is available as a free download. Over a thousand people, I'm told, have already downloaded it and I encourage you to check it out as well. We'll tell you more about it at the end. She's working on another book about the spiritual practice of paying attention. So there is much to look forward to coming from this woman. So I'm delighted to welcome you, Cameron, this morning to guide us through your reflections on one way to approach Advent as we long together for the light. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for that warm introduction, Erin, and thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to see you all this morning or not see you. I know the joy of having your camera off during a Zoom meeting. So if you're embracing that this morning, that is wonderful. Um, let's open in prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Let's all take a moment to breathe deeply, to welcome the presence of God. Think of everything that you're carrying with you this morning, your worries, your joys, your fears, your hopes. Imagine laying them down gently at the feet of Jesus. Feel your shoulders lighten as you release your burdens and relax into the loving arms of God. God of mercy, God of compassion, meet us here today. In these days of darkness, we are longing for the light. Send the fire of your Holy Spirit to warm us, to kindle in us your hope. May our hearts be open 
our ears attuned to the whisper of your voice, the promise of your presence. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. St. Ignatius teaches us to be aware of the presence of God and our emotions and our desires. I want to invite you to pause here for just one moment and reflect on what drew you here today and what your desire is for this retreat, the grace or the gift that you want to receive. Remember that every time we feel called to prayer or to resting in God, God has acted first drawing us to him. So let's take about one minute here to pause and reflect. Let's begin. We are entering an Advent like no other. This year, we are carrying so many heavy burdens. Our world is disfigured by the coronavirus pandemic and economic distress, along with ongoing racism, injustice, war, and a refugee crisis of massive proportions. None of us are untouched by this on a personal level, but also on a national level and a global scale. We are longing for God to lead us into the light. We start in the darkness. We start with a saint who was intimately acquainted with crisis, St. Oscar Romero. Who was he? Born in a small village in El Salvador in 1917, he became a priest in 1942 and lovingly and quietly served his people for over 20 years. In February 1977, he was the surprise choice for Archbishop of San Salvador and effectively Archbishop of the entire country. He was chosen largely because he was not expected to speak up about the deep socioeconomic inequality of the country and the increasingly violent rule of the rich and powerful. All of that changed on March 12, 1977, when Romero's friend and fellow priest, Rutilio Grande, was assassinated by government security forces for speaking out against their harassment and silencing of Catholic priests. From that day forward, Romero spoke boldly and unrelentingly in defense of the poor, the oppressed, and the victims of El Salvador's violent regime. Although he was accused of being a communist or siding with guerrillas, Romero sided with no one but Jesus Christ. He denounced violence, and preached instead the radical love and forgiveness of the gospel. In his final homily, he pleaded with soldiers to disobey orders to kill. He was shot to death at the altar the very next day while celebrating mass. In an interview he gave not long before his death, Romero forgave and blessed in advance those he knew would kill him. He was canonized by Pope Francis on October 14, 2018. In spite of the circumstances in his beloved country, kidnappings, disappearances, 
torture, murder, assassinations. Oscar Romero preached every Sunday on the hope of the gospel. His homilies reached thousands through radio broadcasts. He did not sweep the evil occurring around him under the rug. He addressed it directly, denouncing everything not of God and calling all people to be participants in the great work of God's redemption. His was a great prophetic voice. Where on earth did he get the strength? Where on earth did he get the courage? From God, the same God who offers that strength and courage to us. This morning, I want to offer you some encouragement from St. Oscar Romero and from the gospel. One of the cornerstones of Romero's preaching was incarnational theology which holds that salvation history is not a dusty relic of the past, but something that is actively embodied, something that is taking place here and now in our present history. All of our sorrows and joys, he taught us, bear the presence of Jesus. We need only know how to open ourselves to that presence. During Advent in 1978, Romero proclaimed, some want to keep the gospel so disembodied that it does not get involved at all in the world it must save. Christ is now in history. Christ is in the womb of the people. Christ is now bringing about the new heaven and the new earth. And the work of Advent is involved in this vigilance and faith. To discover the fact that Christ is continually coming. Advent is not just four weeks of preparation for Christmas. Advent is the church's life. Advent is Christ's presence as he uses his preachers, his priests, his catechists, his Catholic schools, all the effort meant to bring about God's true reign. Telling humanity that Isaiah's prophecy is now fulfilled. Emmanuel, God with us. Romero doesn't deny any of the ugliness that marks our present history. He describes the gospel as the light that illuminates everything it falls upon, both the good and true, and the evil and the unjust. The church's word, he says, is like a ray of sunshine that comes from on high and illuminates. What fault does the sun have when its pure light finds puddles and manure and garbage here on earth? The sun has to enlighten all of this. If not, it would not be the sun. It would not be light. It would not find the ugly and the horrible that exist here on earth. Yes, just as the sun enlightens that which is ugly, so too must the sun enlighten the beauty of the flowers and the other beautiful aspects of nature. My sisters and brothers, on the one hand, the word of God illuminates the horrible, the ugly, and the injustices of the earth, and on the other hand, nourishes those of good heart, those hearts that, thanks to God, are numerous and are illuminated with this eternal light of his divine word. In the opening of John's gospel, we are given this promise. A light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Let's go into a few minutes of contemplative prayer time, reflecting on these passages. Here are a few questions to consider. Where can you see the darkness in our present history? Where can you see the gospel illuminating that darkness? What, if anything, can you see more clearly in the darkness? Let's take about two minutes and then we'll come back together. Feel free to write or pray silently um, or to turn off your camera if you need a quick break and I will ring the bell to bring us back together.
few more seconds to wrap up. Welcome back. I want to take just one minute here um, and invite you, if you like, to um, share in the chat a, one place where you can see the light of the gospel in the darkness. If you'd like to share, and then I read those and share with everyone. My family, yes, absolutely. Same. <laughs> Dedication of faculty and all teachers who are working so hard to educate and care for their students. Definitely. My son is in the first grade and I would just like to deliver flowers to his teacher every day. <laughs> The gift of faith, absolutely. Yeah. My colleagues and our slow and steady work against systemic racism. Amen. Amen. And our children who are embracing new ways to learn and interact with others. I've seen so much kindness and compassion from our youngest children. So beautiful. The next generation coming who are giving away their inherited wealth as a protest. Yeah, in service to others. I feel like I should just say, hallelujah, this is all so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Okay, Catholic social teaching and action, family participation, solidarity, community, social justice. Yes, those are my favorite things too. <laughs> to be more present with family, to stay grounded in the gifts of today and to be more aware of the systemic issues in society. That has been one of the great gifts of 2020. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you all so much for sharing. Um, let's talk a little bit more about the light and the darkness. The light and the darkness go way back in our spiritual tradition. Matthew's gospel explains to us that when Jesus first set out in his ministry, he fulfilled these words of the prophet Isaiah. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, toward the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the region of, and shadow of death, light has dawned. The territories of Zebulun and Naphtali were the first to fall to Assyrian invaders, and their territories are the first to which Jesus travels, the first place he sanctifies with his holy footsteps. Jesus is the light, the reminder that God's story has always been about restoration and redemption about rescuing what we thought was hopelessly lost. This dramatic transformation of despair into hope is so central to our celebration of Christmas that this passage from Isaiah is read every year at midnight mass as we literally gather in the darkness on December 24th to proclaim the coming light of Christmas morning. It's significant that Jesus came here first to places with collective loss, grief, and sorrow. We know, of course, that Jesus was born in a humble manger, but he also carried out his whole ministry in what was considered a backwater of the Roman Empire, not a place of great wealth or prestige. God comes to us in this way too, never turning away from our pain, our lowliness, but entering right into it and embracing us there. Let's take a few minutes to prayerfully reflect on how the light of God illuminates each one of us. In our joys, yes, but also in our sufferings. 
And these uh, reflections will just, these are a little more personal, so we keep those private. Here are a few questions to consider. Where are your lands of Zebulun and Naphtali in need of restoration and redemption? Can you dare to hope that the light of Jesus will fall upon them and transform them? We'll take about two minutes here for contemplative prayer and then I'll draw us back together. more seconds to finish up. <clears throat> Welcome back. Jesus is the light that comes to illuminate our darkness, but he also says rather startlingly that we are the light of the world. He uses the same Greek word for light that Matthew uses in his citation of Isaiah. That light that we sometimes have to strain so hard to see, we are called to be that light too. How on earth are we supposed to do that, mere humans that we are? Jesus explains, you are the light of the world, he says. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. This is still a tall order, but St. Oscar Romero has a beautiful insight for us on how we can be the light, especially during Advent. He says, through the sacraments, Christ is present in his church. And this is one of the spiritual matrixes of this time of Advent, being vigilant for that day when the Lord will come. Perhaps it is better to say it this way. We discover that Christ lived among us, but we did not know him. We discover that what you did for one of the least of these sisters or brothers of mine you did for me. How close is this Christ and how few have known him. Advent should admonish us to discover the face of Christ in each brother or sister that we greet, in each friend whose hand we shake, in each beggar who asks for bread, in each worker who wants to exercise the right to join a union, and in each laborer who looks for work in the coffee groves then it would not be possible to rob them 
to cheat them, to deny them their rights. They are Christ. And whatever is done to them, Christ will take as done to himself. This is what Advent is, namely, Christ living among us. What an incredible challenge. Romero is referring here to the theological concept of Imago Dei, the belief that every human being is made in the image and likeness of God and thus has an inherent worth and dignity that must be respected and honored. In El Salvador, the extreme poverty that gripped most of the nation, while a very small few held all the land, wealth, and power was physically and theologically demeaning to those who suffered so greatly. Romero was tireless in speaking out against oppression, but he also had a very real personal connection with his people on an individual level. Put plainly, he saw Jesus in them. Romero extends our embrace of the theological concept of Emmanuel God with us, by calling our attention to its literal interpretation. Right here, right now, Jesus walks among us. Every human being bears the mark of the divine, and we ought to treat them as such. This, of course, is easier said than done. There are plenty of people who annoy us, some who antagonize us, and plenty whom it is simply inconvenient to love, to enter into relationship with. But Jesus himself favored the least of these, and so should we. Let's look more closely at the passage Romero cites above from Matthew's Gospel. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Truthfully, I don't like these sheep and goat passages. Our God, we know, is a merciful God who does not will anyone's damnation. But passages like this one show us how very serious this mission is 
how vital to our Christian life and to our love of God. In the Christian tradition, we are called to the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. We are also called by Catholic social teaching, itself built upon the gospel, to a preferential treatment of the poor, a just distribution of goods, and solidarity with all who suffer. Advent is a perfect time to pause and reflect on how we are doing in this regard. Let's take about five minutes to prayerfully consider how we are doing at being the light of the world and to open our hands and our hearts to God so that he may lead us deeper into love and charity. Here are some questions to consider during this reflection time. Feel free to focus only on the ones that speak to you. Where is it easy for you to see the image of God in others? Where is it hard? Take some time to examine your conscience, asking God to reveal to you the times when you have not seen and honored the breath of the divine and others. Ask for the grace and forgiveness to move forward in love. How are you doing at being the light of the world? Pay attention to the feelings this phrase draws up in you and offer them to God. If your light is feeling dim, ask first for patience with yourself and then for Jesus to envelop your light in his. How can you concretely live out the works of mercy this Advent? Ask God to show you one way you can love and honor the divine in your neighbors. One way you can bring light to the darkness this year. So we'll take about five minutes there.
more minute. Welcome back. Um, so let's take a second um, and share in the chat, if you like, how you are being the light in this Advent or where you feel called to love your neighbor concretely. Thank you, Erin. listening more. Yes, absolutely. Reaching out to people who live alone. Yes. This is a really hard season to be on your own. Donating more money instead of spending it on presents that we don't need. Absolutely. Definitely we're doing more of that this year. easy to see the light in others when they do for others. Absolutely. There's really nothing more beautiful than that. It's there to see the light of God in another person. Okay. Thank you all so much for sharing. Um, I'd like to lead you now. Oh, accompanying those who have just learned they have a terminal illness. Absolutely. That is being the hands and feet of Jesus. Yeah, a really beautiful thing to do. Thank you all. Um, I'd like to lead you now through a guided meditation on the light. Feel free to turn off your camera, stretch or stand, whatever is most comfortable for you. We'll move together through a series of visualizations, which with a little bit of time after each one to pause and pay attention to your body and your spirit. This type of imaginative prayer may feel uncomfortable at first if it's new to you and that's okay. Just stay with it and honor what you are feeling, the movement of God in your heart. Holy Spirit of God, breathe your life and your light into us. I invite you to close your eyes and enter the darkness. Dwell there, imagining the darkness to extend as far as you can see and beyond. Pay attention to your emotions and your physical responses. What is it like to be in the dark? Are you alone or accompanied? Are you at peace or uncomfortable? Imagine now that you see a tiny glimmer far away, something like a spark or a distant star. Imagine that spark beginning to glow, a little bit brighter, a little bit brighter still. Imagine that light coming closer and closer Slowly, you're able to make out the form of it. Edges start to appear, an outline sharpens. You realize that this is not a spark or a star. 
but in fact, a human being. It is Jesus. What does he look like? What is the expression on his face as he approaches you? Imagine now that Jesus is placing his hands directly on top of your head. What does his touch feel like? Within a few moments, you begin to feel a warmth gathering in your body, moving slowly down from your head to your shoulders, your chest, your stomach, your legs, all the way down to your toes. You realize that this wasn't just warmth pouring through your body from Jesus's touch. It was light. You realize that now you are radiating light, just like Jesus. What does it feel like? Now imagine that the light is pouring out of you. Imagine your house, your street, your city, your country, the whole world. And imagine that light spreading like a slow tide over it all until the whole world is lit. What does it look like, this world bathed in light? Dwell there for a moment and take it all in. Rest in it. Breathe deeply of it. Take a deep breath and slowly stretch and make your way back. As you open your eyes and come back to the present moment, make this your prayer. Holy Spirit of God, light for every darkness, illuminate my way. May I love with your love and pass your light, candle to candle, to every person I meet. Amen. Okay, welcome back. I invite you to share um, in the chat if you like anything you feel that you received um, during prayer or during this retreat. Um, it can be a few sentences or even just one word um, describing how you're feeling or what you're carrying with you into the rest of this Advent season. Hopeful. I feel that way as well. <laughs> Seeing the lights of all of your faces is really... Wonderful, thank you. The darkness has been all I've been focusing on. What a reminder that Jesus is the light and that we can amplify it. 
wonderful, peaceful, encouraged, gratitude and hope. Me too. You guys are wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. It's wonderful to be in community with you this morning. Renewed, feeling inspired and ready to spread the light, peace and love. Wonderful. Thank you all so much for sharing, for being so generous of yourselves and your hearts. Yeah, I have not felt the light for years. I still believe, but I cannot get there yet. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, I want to give you one final word of encouragement um, from St. Oscar Romero about the darkness and the light. Um, interestingly enough, I'm getting some nice blind shadows across my face here. So very appropriate for the light and the darkness. Um, this is from Oscar Romero's Midnight Mass homily in 1978. So um, he would have um, just heard that reading from Isaiah about the people sitting in the darkness who have seen a great light. He says, the prophet Isaiah presents us with a light that illuminates the night. We celebrate the Feast of the Nativity on December 25th, just a few days after the winter solstice the longest night of the year. The ancient Romans thought that the winter solstice marked the beginning of the sun's birth. The nights became shorter and shorter until the time of the summer solstice, at which time the shortest night of the year is then seen as the triumph of the sun over the darkness. Christianity and the church took up this pagan feast of the sun, which was called the Feast of the Invincible Sun. The sun does not allow itself to be conquered by the darkness, because even when the longest night of the year appears to oppress the sun, it is at that precise moment that the sun begins its victory march. The church baptized this pagan feast and established December 25th as the Feast of the Nativity. The object of this feast was not the adoration of the sun, which will at some time come to an end, but rather the adoration of the eternal son of justice, Christ our Lord, who is proclaimed by the prophet Isaiah tonight. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Upon those who dwelt in the land of gloom, a light has shone. This Advent, we are in the darkness. There's no denying that, but the light of Christ is coming. We do not believe in death without resurrection. We do not believe that sorrow and loss write the last words of our stories. We believe that even in this darkness, there is hope, there is redemption, there is light. Thank you all so much for coming today and for your heartfelt responses. Um, you all, bear the light so beautifully. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing from your hearts. Um, I, and I just quickly wanted to mention, I do have um, this uh, free devotional Advent with St. Oscar Romero. Um, it's a free download on my website under the uh, blog tab. There's a little place to, send, to enter your email address and it will be sent uh, right to you, a download link. Um, it covers the four weeks of Advent and um, the Midnight Mass homily. And these are the same readings that we are hearing this year that Oscar Romero preached on in 1978. So you can print it, you can just use it on your screen. Um, and it's, um, it's available for you and it's never too late to join in. Um, and I'm just gonna close us with an Advent prayer that I wrote for us today. Um, and I think you'll, I think you'll receive a digital copy of this from Aaron, um, and it's yours to print or return to whenever you like as you journey throughout this season. I'd like to wish all of you a beautiful and light-filled Advent. Let's pray. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. Yet somehow, we still found ourselves in the darkness. 
So God sent the light again, this time with human arms to hold us close, with human eyes to seek us when we were lost, with human feet to walk to Calvary on our behalf. The light came to us in the dark of night, not in a palace of riches, but in a stable filled with dirt and hay. There is no place too lowly for the light to enter. May we open up all of our darkness and make him room. Amen. <laughs>